At base, every military has defensive capabilities. They're able to protect their homeland from foreign threats. Iceland's armed forces, for example, comprise four ships, one airplane, three helicopters, and four radar stations, all operated by the country's Coast Guard. Beyond a small paramilitary peacekeeping unit made up of volunteers, the nation has nearly no capabilities to deploy abroad. In fact, its constitution doesn't even have a mechanism to declare war. Some militaries build on their defensive capabilities with limited expeditionary posturing, ability to wage a small-scale operation abroad. This requires an expensive mix of training, equipment, and planning. Whereas domestic capabilities can be permanent and stationary, all expeditionary capabilities inherently must be designed to be temporary and mobile. This spans from the ability to fire a missile to the ability to cook up breakfast, which raises cost and complexity dramatically. For this reason, large-scale expeditionary capabilities are largely confined to the largest, best-funded militaries like those of France, Mexico, or Canada. But then there's the US military. It is in a class of its own. Whereas most nations can defend at home and some can deploy abroad, the US military has a rather singular strategic posture. They have essentially turned the entire world into home turf. Their goal is complete. It's the ability to fight any sort of fight in any location at any moment. To an American, that might sound like the inherent function of a military, but it's a uniquely US approach. Most militaries are merely designed to respond to relevant regional threats and can scale up to wage a war abroad if necessary. To be able to fulfill this all-encompassing mission, the US military has a degree of flexibility and globality unmatched by any other, which incurs a near endless array of exceptional costs for the force. They pay to produce their own private label of chicken tenderloins and ship it all around the world to places like this base in southeastern Turkey because they run a grocery store there because they have thousands of service members stationed there because that's where they keep about 50 nuclear warheads in case they decide to use one in Europe, Africa, the Middle East, or elsewhere. They pay for professional sports teams to incorporate patriotic ceremonies honoring past and present service members into their games in order to help boost recruiting to the level needed to staff all their roles worldwide. They pay to develop an occasionally viral bipedal humanoid robot because they believe that in the future they can gain a competitive advantage against other forces by having these robots integrate into their ranks and fulfill the most dull, dirty, and dangerous tasks. These costs grow and grow atop each other, then span all around the world. From a spatial and logistical standpoint, covering the globe is nothing less than a monumentally challenging and expensive task. Then there's the temporal component. Making sure that the right soldiers with the right weapons and technology are in the right locations requires a predictive approach and proactive planning. And predicting what future warfare looks like, then preparing for it, is also an extremely expensive endeavor. Take for example the USS Freedom, a first-of-its-kind littoral combat ship commissioned in 2008. At just under 400 feet or 120 meters long, what this ship lacks in size, it more than makes up for in design complexity and state-of-the-art technology. This ship represents two entire decades of planning and predicting, researching and developing, contracting and commissioning. A nearly inconceivable dedication of time and resources, but one that begins to make sense when considering the expectations. When conceived of in the 1990s, the littoral combat ship was meant to lead the American Navy for the next half century. With the Cold War coming to a close, the US Navy had found itself over-indexed in warships designed to patrol and battle on the high seas. Suddenly without a comparable rival, the US was the world's single naval superpower and its fleet needed to reflect this new order. Now the new preeminent worry was pirates, terrorists, and gunrunners zipping along coasts, requiring something nimble, fast, and flexible enough to keep pace in the in-between, the coastal waters, where threats were diverse and warfare often asymmetrical. To fill the void, Navy officials presented two ideas. The DD-21, a larger ship capable of holding its own on tight coastal waters, or what planners called the Street Fighter, a smaller, sleeker, and critically, cheaper option. From the jump, these Street Fighters were more appealing. They'd require smaller crews, they'd be fast, capable of surprising enemies, they'd be stealthy, and with the advent of new hull technology, they'd be light enough to push 45 knots while still having ocean-wide range and carrying a payload. If that wasn't enough to future-proof such a concept, they'd be modular too, capable of switching weapon systems and kits to fit different missions, from surface combat to minesweeping. But still, by 2000, such a street fighter was just a concept. A concept that the Navy quickly turned over to private contractors after it proved too difficult to actualize in-house. 
Entering agreements with both General Dynamics and Lockheed Martin to each produce two ships in two separate models, the Navy handed the project off to the private sector, assuming the competition between the two for future LCS contracts would produce a 21st century mainstay. While the daunting scope had begun to add to the price tag, the Navy hoped these ships could come in relatively cheap by shipbuilding standards, somewhere between $150 to $225 million per unit. By 2009, the US had two ships, one from each contractor, but not four, as budget overrun on both models was so extreme that the Navy cancelled the contracts for the second of each. What was supposed to be in the 200 millions at most had ballooned to about double the price. The issue was, however, the LCS remained a critical cog in the planned New Age Navy fleet and they needed to buy a lot more than two. 56 of them in fact, or 82, or 63, or 55, or most recently 52 depending on their evolving ship force structure projections. But no matter how many, they needed a lot and needed them fast as LCSs were expected to replace old minesweepers and outdated frigates. And rather than settling on a single class of LCS as previously planned to incentivize competition, they proposed Congress an alternative, what they called a dual award strategy offering each company a 10-ship contract over the next five years. All the while, the problems with the Navy's current LCSs were already beginning to show. As a general rule in shipbuilding, a ship can have range, it can have speed, and it can have a heavy payload, but it can't have all three at once. With speed as a principal mandate, both General Dynamics and Lockheed Martin had to get creative and make sacrifices. While both classes are able to reach an incredible 44 knots, some 10 to 15 more than a typical Navy ship, they made separate design choices to get there. For the Independence class, this meant a unique aluminum trimer and hull. As for the Freedom class, while Lockheed Martin went with a more conventional steel monohull, it innovated on the drivetrain side, developing a complicated combining gear that connected the ship's diesel engines with its gas turbines. Both designs were innovative, but both had problems. Aluminum hulls, it turns out, are brittle, and at speeds of higher than just 15 knots or on rough seas, they may well crack. As for the combining gear, well, they were hard to keep running, as the components were buried so deep in the ship that maintenance staff could hardly reach them, and when they broke down, as they did early and often, they were so complicated that Navy personnel had to wait around for Lockheed engineers to diagnose the problem and come up with a solution. Then there was the issue of survivability. Built as a combat ship, the LCS was intended to reach level 1 survivability, the ability to continue operations after an underwater explosive attack. In 2010, the same year it pushed for the Congressional green light for 20 more of these ships, the Navy conceded that the ships already produced hadn't reached level 1 survivability. And still, it got worse. In the rush to get these ships on the water, no time was taken to ensure that all the ship modules actually worked. When they did get to testing the modules, it turned out they didn't. The anti-submarine warfare module proved unreliable because the ship itself is so loud that the towed sonar can't reliably pick up any other noise. Similarly, the Mine Countermeasures mission package, which relies on onboard sensors and an unmanned influence sweep system, has been plagued with delays, breakdowns, and a penchant for causing false alarms. What was supposed to be an endlessly customizable ship, capable for surface combat, submarine hunting, and minesweeping, has effectively been rendered just a gunship that can't take a hit. Regardless of these varying limitations, as of 2023, the US Navy has purchased 30 LCSs. They've broken down at sea, they've bumped into walls of the Panama Canal, they've spent a winter stuck in an iced over St. Lawrence River, they've run a handful of minor missions, and they've averaged about half a billion per ship to build. For a ship that was supposed to be the future, the littoral combat ship has proved nothing short of a disaster, a reality the Navy's finally begun to come to grips with by decommissioning or working towards decommissioning nine of the vessels. The LCS, by all metrics, has failed to live up to its lofty billing. And it has failed publicly and expensively. But it's far from the only decades-long development project that's fallen on its face. Boeing Sikorsky won the contract to build the Comanche helicopter in 1991, but after a decade of work and $7 billion being poured into the project, only two prototypes ever actually left the ground. As for America's first stealth destroyer, the Zumwalt, its gun system has yet to prove the range it's promised, its missile system can't hit targets consistently, and its guided shells cost a prohibitive $800,000 per unit. With similarly high hopes as the LCS, the Zumwalt project was eventually cut after only three ships were built. 
Then, most famously, the F-35, the Joint Strike Fighter, adaptable, future-forward, state-of-the-art, has seen one technical glitch and one busted budget after the next for two whole decades, its cost ballooning to 89% over what was initially predicted. And the list goes on with countless other smaller, multi-billion dollar projects. To a certain extent, such mistakes and miscalculations make sense when working to invent the future of warfare. Expensive swings and misses are part of the development process. But it wasn't always this way, and increasingly, it seems the swings have gotten bigger and the misses more frequent. When the Department of Defense wants a ship or a plane or a weapon system built, there's a select group of five companies it typically turns to. Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, Boeing, and General Dynamics. Excluding Boeing, all these companies earn the majority of their revenue from US or allied military contracts, which only happen with the approval of the US. But even excluding foreign defense revenue, 71% of Lockheed Martin revenue, for example, comes from the US government. That translates to $47.5 billion a year. Put another way, Lockheed Martin is given more by the US government each year than NASA, a major government agency. In fact, if the defense contractor was a government agency, it'd be the 24th largest. It gets more money from the US government than the majority of government agencies. But unlike agencies, thanks to this business, Lockheed Martin profits nearly a billion dollars a month. But war wasn't always such a profitable venture. Technology was what brought the private sector to battle. Whereas in centuries past militaries were primarily defined by human might, the advent of airplanes marked perhaps the biggest instance yet of a non-military technology that could be used to gain a militaristic advantage. During and after World War I, a number of fledgling airspace companies gained modest contracts with the US military, contributing to annual overall production counts in the dozens or hundreds. But then came World War II. Suddenly, the US and its allies needed as many planes as they could get, and with that, the US government started awarding colossal contracts to anyone who could build an aircraft. Lockheed, Goodyear, McDonnell, Douglas, Boeing, Hughes, Grumman, Northrop, Vought, Convair, and more. While all these companies had existed in some form prior, the war was, for all intents and purposes, what established them. McDonnell, for example, went from 15 employees to 5,000. Hughes went from 4 to 80,000. As a sum, whereas in the six years leading up to the war, the US built a mere 20,000 aircraft, during it, the country's manufacturers produced a massive 300,000. But then the war ended, and this was bad for business. Aircraft manufacturers immediately struggled. Some shifted towards civilian aviation, others refocused on auto manufacturing, others still consolidated, while the US government searched for contracts that could be used to keep this new industrial sector, which played no small part in the Allied victory, afloat. Rather quickly though, a new conflict emerged. The Cold War. In its early days, rumors arose that the Soviet Union had produced an inconceivable quantity of long-range bombers. As the world had now entered the nuclear age, this massively concerned American media, the public, and ultimately Congress. It was believed that their newfound enemy could straight up eradicate the US. In response, Eisenhower ordered an immediate ramp up of American bomber production and agreed to a Lockheed proposal to develop the U-2 high altitude surveillance aircraft. It would fly over the Soviet Union undetected, at least theoretically, and get a definitive answer to just how formidable their bomber fleet had become. The answer was not much. It was a mere fraction of what had been speculated, but Lockheed and other manufacturers had already cashed their checks, so the answer meant little to them. A near identical story emerged just a few years later with missiles. The Soviets had launched Sputnik, and the Democrats of the era used the event to propagate a narrative that Eisenhower and his Republican Party were falling behind Soviet technological development. John F. Kennedy, in the run-up to the 1960 presidential election, latched on to inflated estimates of Soviet missile capabilities leaked from the Air Force and started to make the perceived imbalance a central part of his campaign. He argued that his political foes were ignoring this threat, and the American public believed him. Even after having received definitive evidence to refute this fact, he continued the rhetoric. It was just so useful politically, which contributed to an acceleration of US missile development. This was a much needed windfall for US aerospace companies given the waning need for high volume aircraft development. It was this very incident, in fact, that precipitated the first use of the phrase military industrial complex in Eisenhower's farewell address, where he warned of the phenomena's danger. 
The subsequent escalation of the Cold War kept the defense industry alive and kicked off an era of growth as US military spending started to consistently increase, but then the wall came down. With no more Cold War, the DoD warned contractors of massive cutbacks in spending. This kicked off a feeding frenzy of consolidation and acquisition as the industry prepared to weather what they believed would be the first sustained period of peace in their existence. Defense spending did decrease, but only slightly and only for a moment. 9-11 and the ensuing wars quickly returned the US to the historical trend of near perpetual spending build, and today, with these wars largely wrapped up, the new most popular justification for military spending is growing Chinese military might. Now, many of these supposed threats may be legitimate, but it's tough to know with confidence because the defense industry, its lobbyists, and politicians are incredibly effective at shaping public discourse. In fact, the vast majority of the top think tanks are funded, at least in part, by defense contractors. These same think tanks are what are used by politicians and the media as supposedly expert justification for funding to counter new emerging threats. Ignoring for the moment the more unknowable question of whether warmongering for the sake of defense industry profits is effective in practice, it's undeniable that the incentive structures are certainly there. But perhaps the best evidence for this phenomena's influence is the fact that, inflation adjusted, today's military spending is approaching World War II levels despite no active US involvement in any major conflicts. Of course, one can still debate whether this level of spending is justified by the present geopolitical landscape, but what's undeniable is that taxpayers are getting less and less for their money. There was a time when defense spending had undeniably massive downstream effects. The US military was a major financial force behind the development of world-changing innovations like nuclear technology, GPS, and the internet. In fact, in the 1960s, a full third of the entire world's research and development funding came from US defense-related spending. But today, that share has shrunk to a mere 3%, and what was once perhaps the most innovative force in the world has become downright bad at it. The US auto industry, for example, has quickened its pace of development. It now gets a car to market faster. The US commercial aircraft industry has trended slightly slower, yet in the realm of military aircraft, something dramatic has occurred. What used to take three or five or seven years now stretches into decades. A key part of the problem is that the government has taken the inefficiencies of the public sector and pushed them into the private sector where they can be profited upon. When developing a new generation of aircraft or ship or anything, the DoD sets strict parameters. That flips traditional incentive structures. Most industries see the private sector innovate in order to create new products that their customers will want. In this case, the customer tells the private sector exactly what they want, and this industry spends heavily on lobbyists, many of whom used to work for the DoD, in order to shape contracts towards what they can build with minimal risky research and development, therefore stifling innovation. But even then, the risk for the contractor is mitigated further because a big chunk of contracts are awarded on a cost plus basis. That's to say, the government pays for what it costs to build a given technology, then the contractor gets a percentage on top of that as profit. This directly disincentivizes cost efficiency as the more a project costs, the more the contractor makes. Of course, in normal industries, the contractor would still be incentivized towards efficiency in order to win the next contract, but in this industry, two thirds of major weapon system contracts, for example, are bid upon by just one company, while yet more contracts are awarded without a competitive bidding process. Perhaps most egregiously, it's well understood that some contracts are awarded to struggling, ineffective companies simply because the US government does not want that company to go bankrupt and therefore for its manufacturing manufacturing capabilities to be lost. This is perhaps one of the strongest justifications for the spending. The US military cannot afford for Lockheed or Boeing or Raytheon or the other contractors to go bankrupt because they are the only companies in the world capable of producing the technologies that bestow the fighting force with such a technological advantage. So a situation has been crafted where these companies are too important to fail, and they know that, so they can profit off of their necessity rather than their effectiveness. 
The aforementioned only scratches the surface of the deep web of incentives that keeps the military industrial complex alive, but at its core, it's as simple as this. It is good for politicians politically and good for contractors economically to create the perception of problems that simply do not exist. No one gets punished when a threat does not materialize. In fact, they can argue that their response, upon which they profited politically or economically, mitigated the threat. Meanwhile, individuals are punished when a threat they argued did not exist materializes, disincentivizing anyone from doing so. Fear is an incredibly powerful emotion, and at its core, the military-industrial complex has created an incredibly effective system to capitalize upon it. As you might have noticed, the last Wendover video is no longer on YouTube. It's a somewhat long and frustrating story, but to summarize, there was a quick clip in it where you could see some personal info on a passport. YouTube's harassment and cyberbullying policy includes a provision against sharing personally identifiable information such as this, and even though it was clearly unintentional, the video was taken down as a policy strike, which seems fair given the wording of this policy. Unfortunately, unlike with most privacy issues on YouTube videos, because this was taken down as a policy strike, there is no ability for us to rectify the issue even though it could be done with a quick blur, so the video is down permanently, at least on YouTube. You see, a couple years ago, some creator friends and I got together to try to both build on the best parts of YouTube and rectify some of its issues. We called it Nebula, and it's gone fantastically with over half a million subscribers, hundreds of thousands of monthly active users, streamy award nominations, and more, but one small way we improved from YouTube was by adding this, a little button on our back end that allows the creator to swap files on a video to correct mistakes, make improvements, or in this case, blur that passport. So the video's still up on Nebula. But we also designed the platform with a unique business model that allows us to fund higher budget exclusive content, so another video that's up on Nebula is the latest episode of the Logistics of X about arms manufacturing. It builds on this video's topic to show the nitty gritty of how the US military and its industry partners manufacture and distribute the physical weapons of war without those weapons endangering anyone along the way. Clearly you made it to the end of this video, so I know you'll enjoy that one as it was written from the beginning to appeal to those that enjoyed this video. We have a huge slate of originals incoming over the next couple of months, plenty of which I'm sure you'll want to watch. Then, in addition to the logistics of X, we have perhaps the most ambitious, highest budget Wendover original to date in pre-production right now. And if all that's not convincing enough already, it's worth mentioning that we designed Nebula to really be worthwhile not only to you, the viewer, but also to the creators. When you sign up at our link, we'll get a portion of your subscription revenue for as long as you stay subscribed, which gives us stable, predictable monthly revenue that we can rely on for growth, unlike with the ebbs and flows of ad rates. So if you'd like to get access to Nebula's huge catalog of original content and help support the channel, just click the button on screen or head to nebula.tv slash Wendover, and when you do, you'll get 40% off an annual plan, which brings the cost down to under $3 a month.